My belief is that attachment theory has given us the best way to explain how relationships work. The closest science has come. There's a saying I heard recently, and I really believe this, that the root of all pathology is unexpressed fear. Shame is probably the biggest factor in an emotionally unsafe environment. My experience is it's never too late to build a healthy relationship with your child and turn the tide. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Lila Rose Podcast. Today we're going to have on Julie Manano, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist. She is the author of a forthcoming book on secure love, and she does a lot of work on attachment theory and a lot of work with couples, couples counseling. So she has some great gems in this interview about how to approach a relationship that may be on the rocks and make it healthier, how to already, with a secure relationship you may have, make it stronger, and a lot more. I think you're going to enjoy this episode. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening, if it's on YouTube or in podcast app. And don't forget to leave us a review and give us five stars if you're listening through your podcast app. CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com is one of my new favorite clothing companies. CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com is clothes for the every woman. It's chic, it's classy, it's well-sourced, ethically made. And most importantly, Carly Jean, besides having great capsule clothing for your wardrobe, is a company that's pro-life. It's giving part of its money directly to pregnancy resource centers to support moms and babies. Go check out CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. Get a new sweater, check out their skirts, their dresses, their jackets. I think you're going to love it. And use the code Lila30 at checkout for 30% off your order, special for the month of November. That's CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. Use the code Lila30 at checkout for 30% off your order. Julie, thanks so much for joining the podcast. You're very welcome. It's good to be here. All right. So for those who don't know your background yet, and you've done some incredible work on attachment theory, um, share share with us a little more about your background. Sure. So I am a couples therapist by trade. That's my number one hat. And I have been treating couples for about, gosh, 12 years now. Um, I have a a large family. I have six children. And, you know, the story goes that I always was drawn to the the world of therapy, decided to go ahead and have a family. When my youngest was one, I thought, you know, I just started realizing there's something more to relationships, not just romantic relationships, but the relationships with my kids. I think that was probably the driving force. I just felt like there was something missing. Uh, and I wanted to go find out what it was. And I wasn't getting it in self-help books. It was something I needed. I ne- I'm the type of person that really needs to understand something on the deepest level, right? And so I went back to grad school. I immediately stumbled upon attachment theory, which wasn't being taught at the time. So I just kind of did all their work and then learned attachment theory on my own, um, planning to use it with individuals. Because I had no, no interest whatsoever in being a couples therapist. So I know, isn't that funny? And my license was actually a licensed marriage and family therapist. Because in California, where I lived at the time, that's the king license. Most therapists in California are LMFTs. And so I kind of resented having to have that license. But that was the program I found that it was convenient for me. So Fast forward, I get my degree, and then I decided to, I had to see a couple because I had to see a few or, you know, a handful, maybe 500 hours of couples work to get my license. So I saw my first couple, and it was really hard, incredibly difficult. You know, I was used to managing one person, and now I'm in the room managing not just two people, but their relationship with each other. And it felt really challenging and something was really intriguing to me about it. So I immediately, um, that day, I remembered learning about EFT in grad school, which is a type of couples work that's based on attachment theory. Uh, And so I got on the computer, I found the first training that was happening in the US, Um, not the first, but the first, you know, coming up, upcoming one in Montana, I never been to Montana, you know, it's kind of random, but I had to get it. I didn't want to wait, you know, another two weeks for the next one that was closer to my home. So I flew out to Montana, walked in the door and I was like, this is it. This is where I'm meant to be. Just the 
the spirit of EFT, the mindset, the compassion, you know, the way that humanity is viewed in such a non pathological way that I was kind of used to from the other types of thing modalities and such that I was learning about. And from that day forward, I, I never took on another individual as a client. And what it is, and I'm a very strong supporter of individual therapy, I just found something that worked a little better for me. Uh, what it what it was is that when I was working with individuals in doing this attachment work, I was I was really bonding with them and creating this very emotionally safe environment and they were growing as individuals, but then they would go home and they just weren't getting that level of emotional support at home. Their partner a lot of times wasn't really on the same page. Even if they were going to therapy, they may have been getting a different kind of therapy and and it was, it kind of, it just made me sad. You know, it was just hard. That was what was really hard about that, that work with individuals. So when I started seeing couples, that really changed everything. I, I realized like, look, I can help people, not just as individuals, but in their relationship, I can send them home with each other with those emotional support skills that, you know, all ther any therapist who's effective has to be really good at that because that's what creates safety to actually go forward and do the, you know, the therapy part. So that's how I just really fell in love. And then it, it just taught me, you know, learning attachment theory and how to really show up in relationships in a way that creates security uh, just changed my personal life dramatically. And you're right. married, you mentioned six kids, and you're married mm -hmm. too, I think for over 20 years now? Yes, I've been um, 23 and a half years. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. So you're, you're living this as you're teaching it. And, Absolutely. you know, I I love already the direction you're going because, you know, couples therapy, the idea is you're they're both there to work together. And I'm sure there's varying degrees of willingness and all kinds mm -hmm. of issues along the way. But, you know, you're you're talking about this profound thing that you're getting to do and you do do, which mm -hmm. is working with a couple to directly impact, hopefully, you know, and, and empower them to deal with how they're dealing with each other. I think Absolutely. that's part of the loneliness of individuals, couples, individuals okay. therapy, uh, not to say that I think it's bad. I think it's awesome sure. actually, but you're going in and you're kind of doing it solo, you know, and you have to go yeah, take that definitely. home and try to apply it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, and it's very useful. I always push self growth. It's such a big part of this process, but you know, it can be very lonely. So you mentioned EFT, and then we're we're obviously going to learn a lot about attachment theory, um, mm -hmm. particularly applying to couples and their interaction. But we're also going to get into kids and parents. Um, okay. So let's start with what is EFT, okay. and what is attachment theory, and then I want to hear how that's different from other approaches to couples counseling. Great. So EFT is a is a stands for emotionally focused couples therapy. Uh, so just to give you a little background, a man named Dr. John Bowlby in the mid, mid 1940s started figuring out that the children, the distressed children that he was working with had very similar home lives that had a lot of attachment disruption. And at the time that was a pretty profound way to go. It was not very well accepted that the child's home life could impact their functioning in the world as they grew older. Back then it was kind of more Freudian, which nothing against Freud, he did some great things, but it was very much you're, you're born with these kind of internal psychological mechanisms that define who you become. And so John Bowlby really la uh, launched onto this and he started studying it and traveling, traveling all the way around the world, looking at different cultures and the way that they attach and he came up with the theory of attachment, which is that we are wired to connect. Our bodies have an, an attachment behavioral system, just like we have an appetite system and we're driven to eat, mm -hmm. just like we have a sex drive and we're driven to procreate, uh, and that you cannot remove that from the person. You can suppress it, but you cannot remove that from the person. And that it's a function of evolution. I mean, we need to, we need others to have shelter and, Food and I mean, if you're looking at, you know, um, primitive humans, and we still have that drive today. And not only that, I mean, I think some people see it as, you know, more of a spiritual thing, too. And so he started, um, as he went, 
in the later 1970s, someone came along and decided to put all of this to research to test it. And so they started doing a lot of research with children and parents. And that's how they categorize these four different attachment styles, which we'll talk about, I'm sure. From there, it was really just applied to parent-children dynamics. And then a couple of researchers, Hazen and Shaver, came on to the scene. They decided to start applying it to in doing research um, to, with attachment theory in romantic relationships as adults. And that started blowing up and started making a lot of sense. And then someone named Dr. Sue Johnson came along shortly after. And she's actually... I, I, I wonder, I always think about this, I wonder if she's the most brilliant mind of all, because she took it and organized it and turned it into a way to treat couples and created a scaffold out of it, an organized way, you know, a linear way. So starting at, you know, what they can work with and compli going more, going deeper with the couple and expanding upon the work as they're ready to grow. You don't just go in and start the deepest work, you know, you first stabilize their communication and just, you know, a lovely theory. And that's what I do. And so she created Emotionally Focused Therapy in the 80s. And those of us who do that type of work have been doing it, you know, for decades, not me personally, but that's how long therapists have been practicing EFT. And then it wasn't really until the last 10 or so years that it crossed the line, it jumped from um, the therapy community over into the um broader population self people who were into self-help and non-clinical people and uh people started you know really resonating with it and going hey this this start this is making sense i i think my belief and many other people's belief that work in, with relationships is that attachment theory has given us the best way to explain how relationships work um yet They're so the, best, the closest science has come so EFT, you need attachment theory for e to practice EFT. It's a core yes. underpinning of it. All right. So what are the different attachment styles? So we have anxious attachment, which is, we have anxious attachment, avoidant attachment, disorganized attachment. Those are all considered insecure. They're not feeling safe and close enough of the time with their own relationship with self or with their partner. And then we have people who have secure attachment and they kind of live in an overall climate of, you know, safety with their own body and their relationship with ourselves, which we all have, and with their partner. And it takes two securely attached people to come together and have a secure relationship. Mm -hmm. However, any couple can grow toward it, you know, that it's, um, it's very possible. And so let me go back here. So anxious attachment, they're the partners in the relationships who are really desperately trying to close the distance, typically come on strong, want more time together. They're going to react to having their needs go unmet with a lot of protest, sometimes blame, sometimes criticism, sometimes getting kind of big and more escalated emotionally. And the the problem is, is that they grew up in environments that where they weren't getting enough, their emotional needs met enough at the time. They weren't feeling validated. They, they couldn't consistently rely on comfort. Maybe they were shamed for feeling the way they did or told you shouldn't feel that way or, you know, you need to go to your room to be angry. And so they just, they didn't get the emotional support and they were aware of it. Some, somewhere along the line, they got enough of it to kind of know it exists, but they couldn't really rely on it. And so, there's a sense of deprivation. And so that sense of deprivation will show up in the relationship. And usually they are getting into relationships with someone with an avoidant attachment. And it just creates this, you know, they already grew up in a deprived environment, didn't know what to look for. Now they're in a relationship with someone who can't show up for them. And it just creates this internal, you know, state of just loneliness and frustration to varying degrees too. All of this stuff is to varying degrees. And so it, the problem is, is that they know the needs aren't met, but they also don't really know what the needs are. They don't have a felt sense. So even if the needs might be getting met or they, they say a lot of vague things, like I need you to be more emotionally available, but they don't really know how to operationally reach for or put into words or be clear. Well, the problem is, is that even if they did, 
their partner still has a block because usually their partner has what's called an avoidant attachment. So they grew up in an environment where their emotional needs weren't getting met, but they had no idea because it just, they stuffed it. They, the, the environment was more emotionally dry. So it wasn't more, it was less about inconsistency and more about it just not being there altogether. A lot of times they grew up in stable loving homes um, where they have a lot of their other needs taken care of, but there's just not a lot of emotional awareness talking to them about their feelings, helping them, you know, organize their feelings and manage them. And so what they do is they just send all of that underground. It shows up in their lives, but they don't have a connection. They really don't recognize with words and very clearly that, hey, I have emotional needs and they're going unmet. And so what they do is they don't know how to show up for themselves and they certainly don't know how to show up with their partner who also doesn't really know how to show up for themselves. And they get stuck in this cycle. And usually how it will work is the anxious partner will bring up a concern about, you know, closeness or housework or broccoli or who you dated in middle school. I mean, it really could be anything. And then the avoidant partner gets over, you know, gets overwhelmed, but they don't really know they're overwhelmed. And so they just try to get really logical. You know, you shouldn't worry about it that way. Or I, I, you know, we went on a walk two weeks ago. What are you talking about that we don't spend time together? Or they get really defensive, or they might push away the concern with, you know, you're too needy, you're in validation. And they're not the bad guy here, but they don't know how to respond the, the anxious partner's coming in with heat. They don't really know how to bring things up safely. So then the anxious partner now feels invalidated, which the anxious partner's very sensitive to. And they get es- they get more escalated. They get more desperate. They get more protesty. They have, then the avoidant partner now is feeling attacked. And eventually, the way it usually plays out is the avoidant partner typically just kind of shuts down or just starts getting really appeasing, anything to make up, make it go away. Uh, And they, you know, to varying degrees, they go away from each other in a state of tension because they just, you know, at some point a fight has to stop, right? And they, um, you know, over time, they'll make their way back together. But the actual issue didn't get resolved, Mm -hmm. right? We we still didn't get, get this issue of dishes talked about and find this place of resolution with each other working as a team. And we harmed each other emotionally and had this interaction where all these attachment needs were going unmet. Mm -hmm. We weren't feeling heard. We weren't feeling validated. We weren't feeling appreciated. We weren't feeling comforted in our pain. And yeah. And so then we have a disorganized attachment, which is kind of like a combination of the two, but with a layer of even more fear and more mistrust of people that usually people with a disorganized attachment grew up in kind of tr- tr- homes with trauma or just higher levels of dysfunction. Uh, and then we have secure attachment and people with secure attachment are able to communicate with each other around what I call the four C's comfort in a relationship. They con they con they do conflict in a healthy way. You know, they get heated. We all need to have emotional engagement, but they don't throw daggers at each other. They don't disengage. They do it in a respectful, loving, relatively healthy way. I mean, they're not nobody's perfect when we're in conflict. Um, and they, you know, so again, connection, um, cooperation. I again I call those the four C's. They do, they can work through all of those you know, just sharing a life together problems that show up. Um, And, you know, the way that they communicate opens space for them to really truly resolve issues and stay close and connected and maintain their attachment security. Our sponsor today is Seven Weeks Coffee. Seven Weeks Coffee is the coffee of the pro-life movement, organic gourmet coffee. It's called Seven Weeks because at seven weeks old, the pre-born baby is the size of a coffee bean. You're going to love seven weeks coffee. Ditch your old coffee company that's not supporting your values and give 10% of all the money you spend on coffee through seven weeks directly back to the pro-life movement. That's what seven weeks does. It's awesome. Go to sevenweekscoffee.com and you can use the code LILA at checkout for 10% off your order. That's sevenweekscoffee.com. So a few questions. This is all a lot of great information. So first of all, for the, for the first three attachment styles, 
um, for the anxious, the avoidant, and then the basically, I think that it was a disorder, the word you used? Disorganized. Disorganized. Yeah, so people call that fearful avoidant. If fear, someone, Fearful yeah. avoidant. So right. I think, you know, all of us have moments, right, where we get anxious about an attachment we have, right, an important mm-hmm. relationship we have, or we might feel the <laughs> the temptation to avoid the, the situation because we're like, right overstimulated or, you know, we're exhausted or whatever it is, right? So right. I, just to help people understand and put this in context for daily life and people's, da- you know, daily experiences, do all of us have, you know, at times maybe pieces mm-hmm. of poor attachment and that can pop up, especially if there are certain, you know, uh, needs that are not being met, you know, mm-hmm. you're exhausted, you're sick, uh, you know, you're you're pregnant, <laughs> I'm pregnant right, right now, um, or, okay. you, you know, you're whatever it is. Um, but you're talking about something a little different. It's not just about, you know, the rough edges of life. Sometimes this is, you know, no. very deep, yeah. deeply rooted issues that mm-hmm. people have where they they continue to play out these themes in their relationships and they seem stuck in these bad patterns. Correct. Is, is that the difference? Yeah. Yes, we're we're not dealing, you know, when we talk about attachment theory, we're looking at the layer under this the external stressors. We're looking at how do you communicate about what happens when you're stressed? How do you communicate when you're feeling alone? And there's re- how how in touch with you how in touch are you with your emotional experience to begin with? How do you manage your own emotions? Typically people, this is you know, statistically speaking, right? Most people will develop an attachment style, the way they manage their own emotional pain and the way that they manage painful, stressful events in their adult relationship. Most people will have a predominant style, retain that predominant style into adulthood and pair up with people Mm -hmm. who reinforce that style because it's just what they know. There's a handful of reasons I could go into why that happens. With that said, there are times when different parts of us are going to be pulled, you know, up to the surface. Sometimes people do get in relationships where they bring out a lot of different parts and one person shifts from anxious to avoid it in the context of that relationship. Brains are plastic, you know, we're going to always adapt to our environment. Most of the time there's consistency. And, you know, we can always work on ourselves too. And, And so, what I see is that we're going to see, you know, that bell curve. And in the middle of the bell curve, we're going to see most of the people are pretty consistent and have a predominant style. And then on one end, we're going to have people who are growing with each other or growing themselves enough that the relationship environment is shifting. And as they move in towards secure, they start getting in touch with different parts of themselves. And so the anxious partner starts to self-regulate more and get in touch with their own avoidance and the now the they're in touch with their own avoidance and the avoidant who's over there growing is now going wait they're pulling away who's closing the distance here and they might start to become anxious as they sort of figure out you know when you first learn to set boundaries and you kind of go to the extreme with it because you're playing around with the idea you know a lot of people do that when they're trying to learn boundaries and then you sort of back up into that middle zone it's kind of like that on the other end of the spectrum, we have disorganized and it's less about growth and flexibility and it's more about a lack of predictability. So how does this, uh, and then another actually important question is, is it necessarily that as a child, you lacked a secure attachment with your mother, you know, let's say, or maybe with your father or whoever it is. And that's pretty much virtually all the time. That's the reason for your disordered or you're anxious Mm -hmm. or you're, uh, you know, avoidant attachment style? Or could it be something biological or some other trauma or deprivation that entered the child's life? Like, can we Mm -hmm. trace back where this comes from? Do we have a general, generally good sense of how people end up at one of these attachment styles? Absolutely. Nine times out of 10, or let's say eight times out of 10, you're going to see an environment that had some level of a lack of emotional support. Um, now with that said, yes, people are, uh, okay, let me go back a bit. Nobody is born with an insecure attachment. It is a hundred percent relational. However, people can be born with temperaments that can sort of manifest in a, in a style of insecure attachment. I really think that it's probably better 
it's it might be more helpful for people to focus less on the categories of avoidant anxious and more on the broad category of insecure. Hmm. I think that's that can be a little more helpful for people. It, it, they don't get so caught up in well, what am I? You know, but we're born with temperaments. If if you have a fussy baby and that baby sort of has more of an emotive personality and just is probably going to um, because of the way they experience their feelings in a big way be more of an externalizer. Where if you have a very calm baby that's not getting their needs met or a calm child, you know, things can happen at any, really any age. Things can sort of, you know, deteriorate as far as attachment safety goes. But if you have someone who's just by nature really calm and laid back, that that person, child, might be more likely to just be good at stuffing. <laughs> and so um, a lot of times, though, it's related to the way the parent shows up. You know, there's a lot of really common types of parenting that will lead to an, atta- an anxious attachment. There's a lot of types of parenting, a lot of commonalities in the type of parenting that will lead to an avoidant attachment. Now, if you have, let's say you have a home life and it's good enough, right? It's good enough. Your parents are comforting for the most part. You know, you, you're mostly getting your needs met. It's not through the roof emotional support, but it's good enough. Then you go to school and you start getting bullied Mm -hmm. and your parents don't really know how to deal with that, you know? And so you end up sort of alone with it. And maybe you have a parent who is really good with supporting you, but their philosophy on bullies is, you know, you just got to not let it get to you. And so you're not getting emotional support. And yeah, that can affect the way that you experience anything that really has a strong impact on the way that you experience relationships and the feedback you get from others about your worthiness, your emotions that can impact you. So So, it's not as simple as parent child, but parent child is a huge factor. So one thing that when you were talking about, you know, that person who has both anxious and avoidant attachment Mm -hmm. styles, and there's a lot of disorder there, there's, you know, typically trauma, it made me think of borderline personality disorder Mm -hmm. for a moment, because, you know, or you could assign other personality disorders to these um, attachment styles. What's the interplay between that and that you've seen in your work? And Mm -hmm. are we sometimes using like BPD, borderline personality disorder, as a label for someone that's just really seriously anxious in their attachment style? Mm -hmm. Or is that an oversimplification? That a bit, you know, there is a huge overlap. The way I like to say it is if you have borderline personality disorder, and you go through the DSM criteria, exact this exactly the same for disorganized, you cannot have you cannot meet the criteria for disorganized. I mean, I'm sorry, you cannot meet the criteria for BPD without having a disorganized attachment. Okay. But many, many, many people have a disorganized attachment who don't have BPD. So I do think that the the label BPD is useful because we don't have to go around, you know, there's a certain set of symptoms that help people know we're all in this, especially for clinicians, we're all on the same page. We don't have to go through and say all of these symptoms, we can say, you know, I think maybe it's become so stigmatized that we should come up with a different way of saying it, because it's always related to trauma, always, you know, especially emotional invalidation. Um, That's the number one common trait of an of the environment of someone with borderline personality disorder is it is an emotionally invalidating environment, there doesn't have to be high levels of abuse. Um, and so, yes, that is a disorganized, but it doesn't go the other way. Some people have disorganized and they don't kind of act out in those ways that is more common to borderline. So the question I think a lot of people might be thinking right now, you know, uh, on the podcast, we talk about relationships and we've been getting more into parenting. We're going to be getting more into parenting in the future. Um, but a lot of it is dating, relationships, marriage. Uh, you know, what is it, you know, for the parents listening um, or people trying to understand their childhood too, but, you know, what are those things? Like you mentioned, they didn't get emotional affirmation. You know, they're, they're mm-hmm. constantly being starved of that as a kid and that can lead to BPD and mm-hmm. these disorganized attachment styles. Can you give some examples of those parenting approaches that you've just seen in your work? These are, these are mm-hmm. a recipe for disaster with your kids. And then, you know, the parenting approaches that you feel that are really, these, these are the ones that I recommend and that are working. Absolutely. So um, let me just start with this. I have six children. I didn't go back to grad school until I was, you know, had 
my oldest was 10, my youngest was one. And I didn't grow up in an environment where I had my emotional needs met for the most part. Uh, it, I'm not, you know, nothing is all good or all bad, right? And I never want to take away the good experiences from someone, but we also want to look at what didn't work and how's that impacting us now. Um, so, but my experience is, is that it's never too late to build a, a healthy relationship with your child and turn the tide. You know, there were a lot of holes in the way that I was parenting. I didn't, I just didn't know how to be emotionally supportive. In my mind, it was like, you just create the right environment. You have family dinners, you know, they wear clean, nice clothes to school. You put them in a good school and then everything works out. And that unfortunately wasn't, you know, the case. And so what leads to, you know, where do, where does this all break down? Well, first of all, shame is probably the biggest factor in an emotionally unsafe environment. If you're getting messages that some or all of you is shameful or bad, you will start to hide those parts and that will cause all sorts of problems. Um, the way that parents shame is invalidating emotions. You know, you, you get upset, you hit your brother and you hear, you're bad for doing that. How can you treat your little brother like that? Or that's not we what we do in this house. We don't hit. Um, you need to go to your room. Just straight, you know, punishment. And none of these things are necessary. You know, some of that is pretty unhealthy. But consequences, things like that. You know, those things. There's a there's a room for that. But what needs to happen first is let's tend to the emotion, because the emotion's very alive. And nothing sticks if that kid doesn't feel safe first. And so what that kid needs to hear is, oh, you're feeling really upset right now. I get that. What happened? You know, what happened right before you needed to hit your brother? Okay, that makes so much sense to me. I would be mad too if someone came and I was in the kitchen making cookies and someone came in and took the pan and just threw the cookies across the kitchen, right? So it makes sense to me that you wouldn't want your Lego tower, you know, crash down. And at the same time, we don't hit, we don't do that. And you know, that's not an, a, an okay way to handle your feelings. And let's talk about what we can do differently. Let's, you know, apologize or that from that place, you can kind of go into the problem solving piece of it. But there's just so much of that missing, especially, you know, nowadays, I think people are more savvy, but but let's say like the and that's a great scenario to use. And I'm sure any parent listening is familiar with a version of it. Uh, but sure. yeah, one of the little kids is pummeling the other little kid. You know, right. a Lego tower was probably destroyed or something else mm -hmm. ticked that child off. And I think the parent's immediate response, your general parent is, I want to remove harm, <laughs> stop right. the harm from happening, you know, separate the children. But I think you're talking about something in addition, which is acknowledge the frustration that the you know, offending child who is the one hitting in that mm -hmm. moment is feeling because something happened to incite them to hit. So it's not right. just that child is a bad egg and just likes to hit people. Right. That's but so there's gross. something underlying. Yes. There's something underlying the why. And it's the job of the of the parent to in that moment, you're saying discover the why or do you, do you um, just, you know, is it OK to just take a chill pill for a minute and be like, hey, you got to you need to go sit in the corner for a minute and then you can have the conversation. I mean, what if there what if there's a full blown tantrum happening in that in that moment? Well, if there's a first of all, safety first. Right. If there's hitting happening, the first thing we do is stop that. Um, and if if a child is having a tantrum, you know, first of all, I'm going to defer to Dr. Becky Kennedy, who wrote the book Good Inside which I think is an incredible parenting book. And it is very much in line with the work that I'm doing with adults. If people were using that philosophy to parent, even not perfectly, but just using enough of it, I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't have a job basically. And so anyway, to go backward, um, if someone, if a child's having a tantrum, and this is something that I have, you know, had a lot of personal experience with is they need support in that moment. You know, we have a tendency to want to push them away when they're having a tantrum. But what that child needs most is to be pulled closer. Now, what does that look like? It might, if the child is really out of control and doesn't act like they want comfort, it might look like just sitting with them and saying, okay, I'm right here when you're ready. You know, not allowing them to hurt something, not allowing them to be destructive, but allowing them space to have their big feelings 
if they know it's safe, they're much more likely to, you know, learn how to self-soothe. If you're there supporting them, it might look like, you know, it, it could look like a number of things. I'm not a parenting expert in the sense of giving people skills to learn how to manage tantrums. Does that make sense? That's why I'm deferring to Dr. Becky. But the general rule is instead of sending the message, you're bad, you need to go handle this on your own. We're sending the message, I'm the wiser, stronger other, and I'm not going to let you hurt yourself and I'm not going to let you hurt other people or hurt property, but I'm right here with you. And I'm, I'm right here with you as you have these big feelings and I'm here to help you with it. However, that ends up looking as we sit here together. <laughs> well, it, it sounds like I, I actually am a little familiar with her work. And so we're going to get into more different philosophies on parenting. So it's very fascinating to kind of hear your some mm-hmm. of your foundational thoughts on that. But, you know, moving to couples therapy, which, of course, is where you're spending, um, you know, your expertise and, and your focus. What does this look like then? You've got these different attachment styles. You're sitting down mm-hmm. with a couple who clearly is having trouble in the relationship. That's why they showed up. So what does it look like to use attachment styles to under, you know, to, to understand and then to solve ongoing tensions in relationships that a, a couple wants to solve? Okay, well, the first thing is, is before attachment theory became popular with the general population, I never even told people what their attachment style was. So we were, I'm not really necessarily working with attachment styles. I'm working on what's showing up in the relationship and what's showing up right in front of me right here and now. If someone is escalated and protesting, I'm going to work on that. With, I don't need to put them in, a, you know, put a label on them. Labels can help. I'm a big fan of labels when they're helpful. But That's a little background. First of all, my number one goal, my number one job is we don't allow negative cycles in the session. So negative cycles are when they go into that loop of protest, defend, explain, try to convince, out attorney, protest, get upset, you know. And if I'm, if I, if I allow that to happen, that is just reinforcing the problem. Their neural pathways are doing the same thing that they do outside of the session. So I do a lot of stabilizing at first. It's very gentle. It's very compassionate. It's very validating. Um, and that's how I get it. Get If you want to know how where I work with tantrums, it's with couples, <laughs> not kids. We're, we're, um, the biggest, uh, we're the biggest toddlers. <laughs> absolutely. That comes out, you know, the, that nervous system, primitive nervous system stuff shows up in adulthood. And so I, I hold that. I make space for it. I'll say, talk to me, talk to me. You know, they, they can't talk to each other if they, you know, a lot of times I can't have couples talk to each other at all at the beginning of the work. And so I'm saying, talk to me, talk to me. And I just, the first part of the work is stabilizing their negative cycles, damage control. Let's get it to where you guys don't go down this ugly road when you try to talk about difficult topics. That starts to pave the way for more understanding, more empathy and safer communication. As they have the ability to be safer and safely communicate, now we're creating space for more vulnerability to start coming into the room. What are the damage control tactics? Um, speaking from self, when you go into a negative cycle, instead of saying, you never want to spend time with me, it's, hey, you know, listen, first of all, leading with some emotionally supportive validation, I know you've got a lot going on at work. And honestly, I appreciate that about you. That's one of the things that I fell in love with was your work ethic and how responsible you are. And so I don't want to take away from that. But at the same time, when we're not, when I'm not getting my bucket filled for our time together, you know, I start to feel kind of lonely. And so how can we kind of work with each other? That's probably going to, you know, it's going to increase the odds of getting you to a better place than you never want to spend time with me. You're so selfish. All you care about is work. And for the avoidant partner, it would look like, you know, the, the, let's say the anxious partner does show up in the worst way possible and says, you never want to spend time with me. The avoidant partner, instead of getting defensive and shutting down, might say, all right, this is one of those moments where we might be going into this cycle. Let me just be curious about your experience, you know, and validate. Of course, you miss me. I get that. And I appreciate that about you. I I feel honored that I have a partner that wants to spend time with me. You know, here's what's going on for me. 
and let's let's it, that you sort of create the foundation of safety and then who knows how they solve that problem but they go into it as a team that's you know feeling connected instead of letting the real enemy which is the negative cycle and the way they're communicating about the problem get in the way there's more to it than that there's a, a lot of uncovering of some of the deeper stuff going on below the surface um and that yeah so it's it's really what we're doing and i can say this pretty succinctly is we're maintaining the attachment bond as they communicate with emotionally supportive skills behaviors and and um, words everylife.com is america's pro-life diaper company you want baby products that are great for your little one that are well made of the highest in quality ingredients check out everylife.com their diapers and wipes are awesome they're made with your little one's best interest in mind and beautifully everylife.com is a pro-life company so they're giving some of their proceeds back directly to the pro-life movement so stop supporting brands that are opposed to your values or don't care about children in the womb and start instead buying from everylife.com there's a great subscription service and you can use the code lila at checkout for 10 percent off your order that's everylife.com and you can use the code lila for 10 percent off your order and it sounds like in that in that case it requires at least one of them to start doing the work you know kind of raise the white flag a little bit and to say you know either the thing of yeah i'm so grateful for how hard you work you know showing sure. appreciation for the thing they're actually really frustrated about or, you know, the person who's wanting to run away, actually showing up and listening. But how do you get them to do that piece? I mean, if I you're do dealing with, room, you do it, okay, that makes sense. So room. you're yeah, there I, kind of shepherding that. Absolutely. Process. That's where we start. So I'm working with one partner at a time. And we're, we're fig I am curious, I'm stepping into their world. I want to know what happens with you right in that moment when you, when your, when your partner says, this broccoli is a little overcooked. I want to know what the meaning is. You know, a lot of a lot, it's if if there's a trigger there, it's it's m not really about the broccoli. It's about I feel unseen. I feel like you don't even care to speak nicely to me. You know, I feel like my do my needs matter to you? I feel unappreciated. I don't even feel valuable right now. What happens in your nervous system? I do a lot of somatic work. What is that feeling in your body communicating to us right now? It's in really if I'm doing the work in the session, it's what happens for you when your husband turns away from you right now as you, as you're compla as you're you know m listing these complaints right what happens for you when they turn away well i get the the message that they don't even want to be here and what does that mean well they don't even care about the relationship they don't care about me what happens in your nervous system what is your nervous system telling us well it's t and it, this is a process obviously it's not this quick but it's telling me I'm afraid. I'm afraid that they don't want to be here. And what's that going to mean? There's so much richness in that one little moment. There's a somatic piece. There's a view of self. I want to stay up here and blame. It's your fault for not caring. But there's this other little part of me that says, what is it about me that here I am in a situation once again where they're turning away from me? What does that mean about me? That's usually the bottom of the barrel. And then we have the, you know, all the unmet attachment needs that are going on in that moment to feel safe and close. I need to know that you're here with me, that this relationship is valuable to you. What are the preventive things that you recommend? I mean, I think about, for example, the love languages, because it sounds like a lot of this is like they don't feel safe. You know, when, when the worst n vicious cycles start happening, that you're trying to first stop the vicious cycle and then actually address the conflict <laughs> of what needs to be sorted out. And obviously in a healthy situation, you just go right to let's address the conflict and sort this out in a mm -hmm. healthy way. Uh, but, you know, from what, you know, my own experience, you know, I'm married only five years now, but in what I've seen and learned from other couples is, you know, one core thing is you have to care for the relationship proactively uh, to create that bondedness and that, that connectivity what do you have recommendations in that space that you give couples, generally speaking, for how to do that preventive work, preventative uh, work? Yeah, the the part that is the good stuff instead of like just the damage control. Um, so first of all, after damage control comes bonding. Mm -hmm. That then it becomes the bonding phase of the therapy, getting down to the deeper vulnerabilities, having people really truly learn having partners really truly learn how to show up for each other emotionally, how to, you know, the avoidant partner starts to learn 
that, hey, their job in the therapy isn't just to learn how to be more emotionally supportive of the anxious partner. Their job is actually to learn that they have emotional needs too, and they need support too, and to allow that anxious partner in to help them and balance that out. So I'm doing that, you know, as the therapy goes on, that's a huge piece of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I definitely encourage in the book I've written that's coming out January 30th, I talk a lot about like nur just nurturing the relationship. You know, joy is bonding. Joy is a vulnerable emotion. We need to be experiencing that together um, because it is emotional connection. So how are we finding joy? Laughing together, spending time together, nurturing the bond, um, sex, any kind of physical closeness for most, you know, something that most co couples are needing. You know, it, it, that's more of that prescriptive stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, the love languages can help there. I mean, if the couple's really distressed and they're in, in negative cycles and there's so much attachment energy and unhealed wounds underneath the surface, even, either from their childhood or built up wounds that they've done to each other in the relationship, the love languages will not do much. They'll, mm -hmm. what they'll do is they'll become part of a negative cycle. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to buy me gifts. That's what the book says, right? You know, a lot of times couples self-help work and things and even the work I do, you know, when, you know, unfortunately, there, I'm, I can put all this information out there, but I'm not really work. I can't work with every couple, but even the work I do can start to get tied up in a negative cycle. And so, yeah, does that answer your question? I think so. So what okay. does the and what's the name of your book coming out, Julie? Secure Love. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. you know, once you do that initial damage control to get the mm -hmm. negative, you know, downward spiral to stop happening, you mentioned you, the next step is you go into like, we're going to build work on the secure bond part. Absolutely. And so what are some of the ways that you do that? And what are some of the ways that couples can work on that? Well, first of all, I help them speak on a different level during triggers and conflictual moments. Because that those moments are when we tap into the most vulnerability. We're not experiencing vulnerability when we're not triggered. What, I mean, we might be experiencing con a feeling of connectedness and a felt sense, but that's not a problem, right? Mm -hmm. So there's all of this really good bonding material. I mean, think about when you cry with a friend and a friend is comforting you. Think about when you watch a sad movie and you're attuned, you're sad, right? Why do people make sad movies? Because it gives us a felt sense of connection. And so that's what I'm helping. You know, there's so many parts of ourselves that we're just not in touch with. And if we don't start digging into that and putting words to it and getting the comfort for those parts that we, some people have gone a lifetime without, then that stuff is just going to show up all over the place in that person's life and the relationship. I mean, I, uh, there's a saying I heard recently, and I really believe this, that the root of all pathology is unexpressed fear mm -hmm. because fear is, an, is creates anxiety. It creates a constant, you know, or, or to varying degrees, depending on the person, but, you know, um, flood of, of stress hormones and that just does a number on your hormones, on your brain cells, on your neurotransmitters, on your body, on your health. And so if we can get people to get this co-regulation in their relationship, which does require self-regulation, again, we all have this relationship with ourselves that we need to be working on too, so that we can put this work into practice. Um, then it's just, it's nervous system work. You know, at the end of the day, this is all nervous system work. And so many practitioners are addressing nervous systems right now. We have massage therapists, we have somatic therapists, cognitive behavioral. I mean, it's all meant at the end of the day to address nervous systems. And the way I do that is to help couples co-regulate each other and, and not you know, regulate each other. And we can get, obviously, trauma and relationship patterns can get, create a habit of emotion, you know, and that goes back to kind of our, you know, the way uh, on our nervous system is, you know, primed to react or regularly reacts. Like, why do I suddenly feel anxious or fearful or mm -hmm. stressed in these different circumstances or when certain triggers hit me? Uh, but, you know, the root of that to begin with was a thought, right? It was initially you know, the thought, the power of a thought that then you don't even need the thought, the emotion just comes anyways. Um, but it sounds like a lot of this too is y the way you view yourself and the way you view your partner. And Absolutely. I'm, I'm imagine a lot of your work is really, you know, talking through the way that you see 
the relationship, yourself, your partner? What are some of the things that you recommend for couples in the way in their self-talk and then in how they Mm -hmm. think about the, the thoughts that they're engaging with about their significant other? Well, one thing that I work on a lot is um, it, anxious partners are particularly prone to this, but avoidant partners can do it too, is what's called filtering for the negative. Mm-hmm. So if you grew up in an environment with a lot of threat, either emotional threats of emotional and safety or even threats of physical harm, threats of being verbally attacked, um, it's all emotional at the end of the day too, um, you're going to be scanning for safety a lot of the time. Because that's how you had to survive. That's how you stayed safe is I'm scanning for safety so I can prevent bad things from happening. If you take that into your relationship and you're constantly scanning for safety, what are you going to see? You're going to see the things, the areas where your partner is, is dropping the ball or getting it wrong. You, it might be ways that are stemming from realistic expectations. And some people have really unrealistic expectations. Now you're going to be communicating based on that model that you've built, which is they're always letting me down. So your partner does, you know, 10 things in a day, nine of them are supportive. And the one er the one time that they drop the ball, that's what you bring up to them. What's going to happen? They're going to start to feel demoralized and like, no matter what I do, I can't get it right. I can't be perfect. Um, So yeah, I definitely work on a lot of that. I'm looking at anything that is what I call a move in the negative cycle that is coming from somewhere. So filtering for the negative, absolutely. I'm going to be looking for why did you need to learn to think negatively about yourself? What's the function of that? Why do you need in your relationship to see your partner chronically through this negative lens? Where's the safety in that? Everything has a very, very good reason. And I need to figure out what that reason is so I can help them get that need met in a way that isn't actually counterproductive. What's your advice to someone who would like to go to couples therapy? They'd love that, but the Mm -hmm. other part of their couple is not interested. They don't see the need or the hostility has reached a point where they're not willing to go or there's, you know, other issues in the relationship. Great question. So the, the term it takes to is very much true. But sometimes it gets taken out of context because it doesn't take to to get the ball rolling toward health. It does take to ultimately to have a safe and close, securely attached relationship. It is not possible to have a securely attached relationship if the other partner isn't doing the work, if they're not self-regulating, if they're not trying to grow and trying new things. However, there is a lot to be said for one partner to step, <clears throat> excuse me, step back, focus on becoming their best self, get themselves out of the negative cycle so that they are no longer reinforcing the problem. Learn new ways to communicate. It's very difficult when you don't have a partner on board with you because you just want to get pulled. The negative cycle can feel very, very safe. People wouldn't do it if it didn't feel safe and comfortable. So you have to kind of make this commitment. I'm going to start changing on my side of the street over here, whatever, regardless of what they're doing. And that's really the only, you know, changing yourself for the, you know, predominant reason of changing your partner is not really, that's kind of that way of thinking about it doesn't really change. I mean, it can get the ball rolling, but really we need to be changing because we want to have a good relationship with ourselves. We want to have a good relationship with other people in the world or, you know, should we find ourselves in a relationship in the future or have we been practicing being our best selves? You know, there are there guarantees? Absolutely not. There's no guarantee that any relationship advice out there will work. Mm-hmm. What we can do is we can increase the odds. And I think that this work, when used properly, and even not perfectly, but when it's used in a good enough way, is going to increase the odds more than mm-hmm. any other type of work. Because you're getting down to the root. You're not viewing your partner as an enemy. I've got to set boundaries or I've got to learn to speak like a robot or I'm just going to learn to say these things in a new way and that's going to cure everything. Um, it's a really mu- it's just a deep, much, much deeper dive into the process. <clears throat> Julie, where can people find your work and learn more about both themselves becoming stronger and healthier and their, you know, how to improve together with their significant other, their relationship? 
Okay, so I have an Instagram account that I started in 2020 after I was working with couples for a long time. I started uh, my someone suggested I start an Instagram account. Didn't really know what that was, and I mean, kind of. I, I was like, "This is for kids." Um, got on there and I was like, "Oh, well, I have to put something on here if I have the account, right?" And so I just started drawing little cartoons to help people understand this attachment stuff, and um, so that really blew up pretty quickly. And there's a lot to offer on that account. A lot. I mean, it is unbelievable how much information I have on there. So if you go to that account and there's a little start here highlight. And if you push that, that'll kind of get you up to speed on all of this information land, the foundational understanding of attachment theory and your relationship. And um, from that, I ended up starting a book. I, I spent three years writing a book to consolidate, to sort of consolidate everything I know, um, how I work with couples, the process that I take them through from beginning to end, the self-help version of that. Um, start starting with attachment theory, kind of a, you know, few pages of explanation there. I know that can be kind of that science can be kind of boring for people who are like, I just want help. Um, but then we go into all the different attachment styles, what your childhood environment was probably like, you're probably going to, you know, relate to more than a few things I talk about how these attachment styles are showing up in your relationship. Now, let's stabilize your negative cycle. Now let's start to learn to repair the negative cycle. All couples have negative cycles. The healthiest of couples will have negative cycles. It's not about not having them. It's about re it's about fewer and less escalated and repairing them, full repairs. Then we go into um, attachment injuries, which are really old wounds that people have built up, you know, things that they just aren't over um, that we can't really talk about unless we start to have some safety around the topic. You didn't show up in the hospital until I was, you know, eight centimeters dilated because of you, you had to do something for work or an affair or just major betrayals, feelings of major betrayals, which are very subjective. Um, and then we go into sex and some other sort of like extenuating circumstances, mental illness, personality disorders, um, substance abuse. And then I have an entire chapter with scripts. People love scripts. Um, some people are like, I would never say it this way. So I would say, look, I don't know how you speak. I can't speak for everybody's, you know, way of speaking, but I put it out there very generically, kind of what I said to you about, Hey, I know you're busy. I know you're working hard here, but here's what's happening for me. And so I just do a whole chapter on what if you're annoyed with your partner? What if your partner, you know, lets you down and I give a few different examples of ways that you can rephrase it just to sort of take them in and let them become your own over time. Uh, yeah, so that's the book. It's called Secure Love. And it's available um, for pre order everywhere books are sold. We've got dozens of languages. And, um, you know, it's, it's <clears throat> pretty exciting. Thanks, Julie. Well, we're excited to hopefully have you back on the podcast when your book comes out and love it, um, yeah. deep dive it even more. But thanks so much for providing this overview for our audience and keep up the great work. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening, whether it's on YouTube, if you're watching or you're on your podcast app, and we'll see you next time.